Wagner. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to give this kind of talk. You know, today is a special day, and for those celebrate Chinese New Year, a Happy New Year. It happened to be the day. <laughs> so it's my pleasure to give the talk in the first day of the year for Chinese. <clears throat> well, um, last time I gave this kind of talk is a long time ago when Peter Crouch is still here, the dean. So uh, I'm glad that actually uh, we, we resumed this uh, seminar, uh, seminar series. I think that's a good you know, uh, way to communicate research uh, with faculty members, between faculty members, and also it's important for all graduate students and the grad student and to, to be keep up on research. <clears throat> so the topic and give today is airborne transmission of COVID-19. You know, I'm not an expert of COVID. You know, I, I don't consider myself to be an expert COVID. However, I feel the responsibility of learning some, you know, <clears throat> based on my background. I think that's, you know, the scientists, researchers all over the world are studying COVID right now, regardless of what you do before, we're all concentrated on this topic, you know, because we are, every single one of us being affected. I just do my part, <clears throat> hopefully, you know, and, and the work that we um, slowly, we gain some knowledge, hopefully this knowledge we learned in the past year can help uh, our graduate student to understand this better. And, <clears throat> and hopefully this can move and towards Eventually, we're going to be okay with this uh, pandemic. Well, there one day we're going to be okay. <clears throat> so this is the outline for this talk. I first give you an introduction about COVID and SARS-CoV-2. I'm pretty sure there's no need and to give this kind of introduction, but I'm still thinking uh, it probably is a, a good idea to, to introduce a little bit, to introduce a little bit more I think those participants uh, need to mute. So I, I heard something, so they, they probably want to mute their computer. <coughs> uh, <coughs> so I first give you an introduction. Um, although I don't think the introduction is necessary, but you know, still this is gave a little bit of introduction. And we'll talk about three topics, three topics that research has been done in my research lab in the past you know, uh, a year. The first one is we use um, exogenous surfa surfactant therapy to treat COVID-19 patient. The second topic is we studied aerosol interactions with lung surfactants. <clears throat> we talk about an in vitro biophysical study and an in silico molecular dynamic simulation. And finally, we introduced the face mask usage um, during this pandemic. <clears throat> so all three topics uh, I'm going to introduce very briefly. And just for the purpose of introducing the concept to our graduate students, but not go too much deep. So based on the time availability. <clears throat> we are in a pandemic right now. So uh, all of us and uh, nobody survived, you know, and actually we all part of the pandemic, but we're also lucky that actually we are not infected so far <clears throat> because, you know, as of yesterday, when I prepared this talk, one out of 70 humans on earth has or had been infected by COVID-19. <clears throat> I talked to my postdoc advisor. He's, uh, uh, 80, uh, he's uh, 80 years old, 80, 82 years old. I asked him, have you seen anything like this? He said that not in his lifetime. <laughs> <clears throat> so last time human beings see this kind of pandemic, it's 100 years ago. <clears throat> the scale and intensity of the pandemic is overwhelming. And I think the researcher scientists all over the world has one common task and responsibility to address this pandemic in their best capacity. <clears throat> That's why we actually try to do something about this as engineer. <clears throat> Um, I still include a, a, a brief video to uh, introduce the pandemic, even though I don't think it's necessary, but I think it's uh, good to introduce some terminology and by reading this uh, very short two minutes video. In December 2019, China notified the World Health Organization of several cases of human respiratory illness, a disease later named COVID-19. 
The virus causing this disease is known as severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. The disease spreads through small droplets that are expelled from the nose or mouth when a person with COVID-19 coughs or exhales. Therefore, standing close to someone who is infected can put you at risk. These droplets can land on your hand and be transmitted through something as simple as a handshake. If afterwards you touch your eyes, nose or mouth, the so-called T-zone. The virus is known to survive on different types of surfaces, so touching these contaminated surfaces and then touching your T-zone brings a high risk of infection. What do we know so far? The coronavirus is spherical in shape, and its genetic material is encapsulated by different types of proteins. Some of the key structural ones are spike S protein, the most prominent feature of coronaviruses from where they get their name, then M or membrane protein, and the so-called envelope protein. <clears throat> okay, that's a very short video, <clears throat> just to introduce a little bit about this pandemic. We have a terminology and the disease is called COVID-19. <clears throat> the virus that caused the disease called SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> and this <clears throat> video specifically talked about uh, the, the transmission routes of this uh, disease. <clears throat> so in general, how our pathogens are transmitted. <clears throat> so in general, uh, uh, pathogen transmitted <clears throat> in, uh, it could be non-human way. So it called a, a abiotic way. <clears throat> For example, you can get it from an animal. And, and about COVID-19 specifically, uh, we have learned so far that actually human being can pass the virus to cats, but not dogs, but not reversed. <clears throat> as far as we know, cats is not going to pass the virus back to us. <clears throat> and most importantly, the virus is transmitted between humans. So human to human transmission is important. <clears throat> so there are different ways that, you know, in general, how the virus and the bacteria germ is transmitted, <clears throat> direct contact. You have handshake with people that actually, you know, been infected, you know, for example, there's some saliva, saliva, uh, residue on the hands that actually, you know, you touch it, you touch your mouth and touch your nose and you got infected. <clears throat> Another way is the indirect contact of the format. <clears throat> the format uh, in the transmission is, you know, you touch the hand dot, you know, uh, hand, knot, uh, hand knots, for example, you know, and, and you have some of your saliva, a virus residue in there and then somebody else touch it, touch the mouse and nose got infected. <clears throat> Another way we know that the vir uh, virus bacteria, some bacteria virus will be transmitted by droplet, <clears throat> such as Ebola. When people coughing, sniffing, they, cough, they discharge this kind of fairly large droplet. And this actually <clears throat> is another problem. So that actually, you know, the disease transmitted so quickly and most importantly, I want to talk about specific today is airborne transmission. Airborne transmission, I will talk about later, uh, the droplet is very, very small. <clears throat> so basically, it's more like a evaporated droplet. They still try to stay in air for a much longer period of time. <clears throat> so for airborne transmission, there, we know there are few virus. It can be transmitted by airborne transmission. That's what we call the uh, aerosol. And another way is called a, a phaco oral transmission. Phaco oral transmission, uh, uh, as the very beginning, uh, and I think the very beginning of the pandemic, you know, scientists worry about this. But after so many, uh, after a year, now we learn this better. Uh, uh, that's actually we knew that the, the chance of phaco oral transmission is actually very low. <clears throat> as a matter of fact. What we know right now is even the transmission route of fomite, which is indirect contact, the, the chance is very low. <clears throat> and because the scientists still won't be able to, uh, <clears throat> to culture live virus from any surface. So in other words, this leave this drop in the airborne transmission probably is a major route of transmission of SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> there are few virus so far as known that can be transmitted by airborne, in other words, by aerosol, <clears throat> such as influenza. 
uh, tuberculosis, measles, chicken, po uh, uh, chicken pox, <clears throat> SARS that we know also transmitted by air. <clears throat> How about SARS-CoV-2? So there's a lot of controversial about the transmission rods. And in last year, <clears throat> especially when this pandemic just got started, and after a year of research, as you may know that there are more than 100,000 papers been published already about COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2. <clears throat> and, and the scientists, the researchers know more and more that actually this virus most likely is transmitted airborne. <clears throat> so what are the differences between the droplet and the aerosol then? We talk about droplet and aerosol, what's the difference? The primary difference about this in physics is the size. The droplet is fairly large particle, <clears throat> usually larger than five micron, could be much larger, 100 micron. <clears throat> so because of the large size of the particle, <clears throat> And this droplet, once discharged by a cough of sneeze, will subject to gravity and quickly settle down onto the ground. So the lifetime of this virus in air will be very, very short. So the transmission distance is usually less than six foot. <clears throat> That's how the CDC set up the six foot regulation for social distancing. <clears throat> Aerosol, on the other hand, <clears throat> a much smaller particle. Usually the aerosol is formed by evaporation of droplet. Once the droplet is discharged by a sniff, a cough, you're losing water because it's evaporating. <clears throat> so the residue is called a droplet nuclei. It's very often we call it aerosol. It's a size of less than five micron. It could be much smaller. It could be one micron, it could be even smaller. <clears throat> Because of small size of the aerosol, it doesn't subject to gravity. <clears throat> it's gonna stay in air for a long time, could up to hours. <clears throat> it also have much longer transmission distance. Research showed that could be as much as 26 feet, or even longer. <clears throat> Another very, very important difference between the droplet and the aerosol is the droplet production needs a cough and sneeze. However, the aerosol does not. Research have shows that simple breathing is enough to discharge aerosols <clears throat> with virus. One research just shows that actually every individual infected COVID-19 patient, <clears throat> for every exhale, they have a cultured live virus in their exhaled gas air, <clears throat> okay? So the threat is real. <clears throat> so this video actually shows that the transmission distance <clears throat> of droplet and aerosol, as you can see here, the propagation distance is much, much longer than the six phase regulation by the CDC. This video shows that <clears throat> using laser technology, <clears throat> you are able to visualize the simulated sneeze and the cough. As you can see here, <clears throat> the particle, especially smaller one, they move a much longer distance compared to the fixed fate regulation by CDC. <clears throat> so if those aerosol <clears throat> floating in air, <clears throat> At a certain concentration, especially in indoor environments with poor ventilation, <clears throat> if you happen to pass by, you breathe in those particles or aerosols, there is a chance you'll be infected. 
So in this case, we want to talk about how does the aerosol deposit in your lung? <clears throat> aerosol deposition in your lung actually is determined by uh, the size of the particle, mostly. And of course, other probably also affect the deposition, but mostly is the aerodynamic size of the particle. <clears throat> in a larger particle, for example, <clears throat> those five to 10 micron large particle or even larger, those particles will be trapped in the throat. So it's not going to go too deep. It will be trapped here. And those particles subject to uh, inertial uh, impaction because it's fairly large. It's moving much faster. <clears throat> it's fairly big, end up uh, in the throat or uh, maximum go to the tracheal bronchial regions. At here, those particles will be cleared by mucothelial uh, 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 um, escalators, by mucothelial escalators. So as we know that actually the cleaning mechanism in the upper airway is mucocilia escalator. Basically is you have the mucus pushing forward, upward. So any larger particle in this region will be pushed back to the throat and you either swallow it and you spit out. However, when the particle is in a smaller size, the medium size, one to five micron in this range, it can penetrate into the small airway region. <clears throat> in that region, the particle subject to gravitational sedimentation, it will settle there and stay a long time in there. And if the particle is even smaller than one micron, <clears throat> and those particles have the chance to get very deep into the lung, into the alveolar region, which is the 23rd generation of the lung. <clears throat> At here, once they settled, it's very difficult to remove it. Especially if the particle is very small in a nanometer range. As we know that the clearance mechanism in the alveolar region is microphage. Uh, effect, uh, effects but we know the microphage only recognize particle in certain range. When the particle is too large or too small, it will be not recognized by the microphage. So in other words, if the particle is too small in a nanometer range, it will be very hard to be cleared once it gets into the lung. <clears throat> You can imagine that actually the virus, if this particle uh, aerosol carry the virus, it can carry the virus into the lung directly. There is such a possibility. Okay, as we all know right now, in general, we know that the virus will be uh, duplicated in the upper airway. Once it's reached a certain concentration, it can propagate into the lung and cause a problem. <clears throat> That's how people change from asymptomatic into symptomatic. So, however, because of the aerosol can get into the lung directly, there is a real chance that actually the virus can be delivered into the lung. Of course, it depends on concentration. The virus has to have content, certain concentration in order to trigger in the problem. So, but this concentration so far is so, so far is unknown. <clears throat> so once the virus actually get into the lung, alveolar region, it will attack the type two epithelial cell. So here I show you a single alveolars. The alveolars actually is considered two different cells and, and the, the type one epithelial cell, type two epithelial cell. And as we all know that this virus is gonna attack uh, endocytic cell of a uh, blood vessel uh, by bending to ACE2 receptor. But some of you may not know, it's also gonna attack the type two epithelial cell because ACE2 receptor is also expressed on the surface of this cell. As you can see here, the SARS-CoV-2 virus here come to interact with this bulky alveolar cell called TAP2 cells. <clears throat> the functionality of TAP2 cells is to generate surfactants. Once the cell is attacked, a legitimate hypothesis is the production of lung surfactant will be affected. <clears throat> so here come two lung surfactants. 
So type two cell actually produce lung surfactants. What is lung surfactants? Lung surfactants actually is a combination of phospholipid and protein. So there are about 85% of phospholipid, 5% of cholesterol and 10% protein synthesized by type two epithelial cell. Once it's synthesized, it forms a thin film at the air water surface of the lung. It has two physiological functions. The first one is host defense against the inhaled pathogen par particles. It can label the particles and signaling macrophage to clear those particles. Another very important biophysical functionality of lung surfactant is to reduce surface tension. <clears throat> we maintain a very large lung. We need to maintain a very low surface tension, otherwise we cannot open up the lung so that we cannot breathe. So in other words, if the surface tension generate uh, decreasing property being damaged because of the lung surfactant production being damaged, we will have a problem in breathing. <clears throat> so how does COVID-19 kill the patient? COVID kill patients mostly by developing into pulmonary complication called ARDS. Acute respiratory distress syndrome is a major mobility and mortality of hospitalized COVID-19 patients. <clears throat> The mortality rate of COVID-19 induced ARDS is about 40% and the virus from country to country. <clears throat> I talked to my friends, physicians, you know, pulmonologists in China. When this disease was first discovered early next, last year, and the failure rate, you know, the mortality rate of COVID-19 induced ARDS is nearly 100%. So in other words, all the patients who've been put onto a ventilator will have a problem and most likely passed. <clears throat> so uh, uh, Tyler, you may want to uh, mute. Tyler, Yamon, you may want to mute. Okay, I can hear you, thanks. And um, please mute, please mute your computer, okay? <clears throat> so <clears throat> what is ARDS? Uh, ARDS is very complicated, you know, a uh, 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 very, very complicated lung complex uh, um, uh, condition. So it's usually caused by inflammation. And the inflammation is actually gonna damage the alveolar capillary barrier in the lung. So the consequence of the damage is there's gonna be a massive edema flooding into the lung region to flood the lung. So in this case, surfactants will also be inactivated. So in other words, you're not gonna maintain the low surface tension in the lung. So this is gonna further make the problem even worse. So therefore surfactant inhibition may play a role in the passive physiology of ARDS. So therefore we are able to hypothesize that if your surfactant been damaged in the ARDS, can you rescue those patients by supplying more surfactants extracted from animals' lungs? <clears throat> That's our basic hypothesis. We hypothesis that surfactant therapy might be used as a supportive therapy to treat COVID-19 patients. Those develop into ARDS or before they develop into ARDS, <clears throat> okay? So, so far there are several ongoing clinical trials about a surfactant therapy to treat COVID-19 patients. <clears throat> uh, here I listed uh, five of them. Uh, one of them, the second one, is run by my colleague in London, Ontario, Canada. Canada. So we try to use a surfactant extracted from cow's lung called the blessed bovine lipid extract surfactant and to treat patients with COVID. And the clinical trial right now is ongoing. <clears throat> so when you, when you design a clinical trial of using surfactant therapy to treat COVID patients, there are several things you wanna be careful about. 
uh, <clears throat> number one, timing. The timing is extremely important. So, and, and surfactant has been used to treat premature babies that born too early, they don't have surfactant synthesized. So that you need, you need, uh, oh, I have a, one question here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, <clears throat> and when the baby born too early, their lung cell is not mature enough so that they cannot generate enough surfactants. So in this case, we gave them surfactant extract from animal's lung. So we know from this practice that the earlier you gave them, the better. So the same rule may also apply for COVID patients. The earlier you treat them, the better. In other words, don't allow those patients to grow into the severe cases and give them surfactants. That probably is the key to treat them. Another one is actually what kind of surfactant we're going to give them. There are many different surfactants. <clears throat> you can treat patients. So you can use synthetic surfactant. You can use surfactant extracted from animals lung, from cows lung, from pigs lung. What is the best surfactant? Another one is the, what is the best way to deliver surfactant to the patient? So, so far the surfactant is given by uh, intratracheal uh, delivery. So basically you're gonna intubate the patient and you pull surfactant into their lung directly. Or you can also give the patient by aerosol. That's another possibility and an even better one. <clears throat> and also the ventilation skill. Ventilation strategy is very, very important. You know, most of the patients actually in the severe cases, COVID stage, been put onto ventilation, ventilator. We all know that a ventilator actually is, can be an additional, an important damage to the patient's lung if it's been used wrongly. <clears throat> okay, how are you going to coordinate the ventilation strategy to surfactant therapy? That is actually an important uh, task to study. <clears throat> and another one is actually can we use synergetic drugs? to be used with surfactants. So, so far we know that the few drugs, there's no cure. One problem about COVID-19 here is so far there's no cure. <clears throat> but there are a few drugs that have been tested to treat COVID such as corticosteroids. <clears throat> One study we, we try to do is actually we can use surfactants to deliver corticosteroids into the lung directly instead of through IV. That's another possibility and potentially a good way to treat COVID patients. <clears throat> so this is actually everything we study about a topic number one. So exogenous surfactant therapy to treat COVID patients. So we're gonna moving on to the second topic is once the aerosol get into the lung, how does it interact with surfactant system? So in this case, we're gonna use two different techniques to study. One is biophysical study. Another one is Molecular dynamic simulation. <clears throat> so this cartoon shows when you have particle or aerosol into your lung, depends on different hydrophobicity, it's going to interact with the lung surfactant film differently. <clears throat> so we have developed a technique called a constraint drop surfactometry. It's an experimental technique we invented in our research lab that allowed in vitro biophysical simulation of the alveolar environment. This allowed us to do the measurements to analyze how does the particle interact with lung surfactant in in vitro environment. And we use the surface of three millimeter droplet to simulate the air water surface of one alveolar. And we have developed, so developed an AFM, atomic force microscopy technique that allowed us to visualize the surfactant film at the air water surface of the droplet. So in other words, this technique allowed us to study both thermodynamics, physiology of the surf lung surfactant film, biophysics, but also allowed us to study the microscopic structure of the surfactant interaction with surfactant, uh, uh, the particle interaction with surfactant film. <clears throat> so, the technique we developed, uh, CDS, we use a closed-loop axisymmetric dropship analysis to control the droplet motion. 
So the basic idea here is how do we determine surface tension from a droplet? So by analyzing the shape of droplet, we use a graphic technique. We look at the shape of the droplet. Technically speaking, the flatter the droplet, the lower the surface tension, the rounder the droplet, the higher the surface tension. So, and then we put this into a closed loop so that we are able to control the surface area volume and surface tension of the droplet. So in this video, I show you how we control the volume of a droplet. As you can see here, we have a, initially we have a stage. So this is our constant drop surfactometer stage pedestal. Now I'm gonna give a signal to the software. I wanna tell the software to form a droplet with a volume of 60 microliter. It's gonna form the droplet automatically stop. I tell the, my, I gonna give this information to my computer software to tell them reduce the volume 10 microliter each time. It automatically does that. Now we're increasing the volume 10 microliter. It automatically does that. <clears throat> As you can see here, everything is automatic. We are able to take a full control about the motion of the droplets, which allowed us to do a lot of experiments that cannot be done before. So for example, we can maintain a droplet with a prolonged time period of time. As you can see here, if you don't control anything, a water droplet is going to reduce volume by 30% in half an hour. However, using our technique, we're able to maintain a 100% volume forever. <clears throat> and this simulation shows that how we study lung surfactants. As you can see here, we compress the film, the surface tension decrease. We expand the film, the surface tension increase. The surface tension changes is indicated by the shape of the droplets. The flatter means lower surface tension. The rounder means higher surface tension. So this is gonna be a full simulation about our respiration. So during our inhalation and exhalation cycle, that's how the surface tension gonna change in our lung. Not only that, actually we are able to simulate different waveforms using a droplet. We are able to create this kind of, you know, arbitrary waveform generator using a droplet. We can create this kind of fine motion of droplet, triangle motion, square, saw two. And all of this allowed us to study the rheology of the film absorbed onto the surface. It's a very powerful tool, a very powerful tool, allowed us to do a lot of research we cannot do before. <clears throat> so this setup shows that how we study the aerosol interaction with lung surfactants. So what we do here is we fill the chamber with aerosolized particle. On the other side, we use a laser diffraction to measure and maintain the concentration of the particle. And we study how this aerosol suspending in air affect the lung functionality to simulate if you inhale those particles into your lung, what's gonna happen? So here we show you a different concentration of two airborne particle. The first one, the carbon nanotube, the second one, the graphene nanoplatelet. At a different concentration, how this is going to interact with your lung surfactant system. Uh, as we look at this carbon nanotube figure, as you can see here, without particle, we are able to reduce surface tension to a very low value. When you're increasing the particle concentration to 4.5 micron gram per cubic meter at a very low concentration, it doesn't affect this surfactant much. However, if you increase this concentration to about 60 micron gram per cubic meter, your surfactant does not work anymore because it cannot decrease surface tension anymore. <clears throat> okay, and this technique allowed us to estimate the occupational exposure limits of those airborne particles without using animal. And this is actually uh, something very big, especially in Europe. Actually, my colleague uh, using this technique in Europe are uh, doing a lot of 
nanotoxicology measurements. I'm probably gonna show you some slides later. <clears throat> and we also develop a technique allowed us to do the AFM imaging to check what happening at the surface. As you can see here, the long surfactant without a particle look like this. When you have particle, it look like this. So in other words, you have big chunk of stuff absorbed to the surface. What are those things? You know, the problem AFM is it only determine the topography, but doesn't tell you anything about chemical. So what we did is we recover those nanomaterial from air, and then we determine the size and shape using electron microscopy, and we compare to what we found in AFM. We found the match. So with hypothesis, we suspect that those things will be those nanoparticles absorbed to the surface. Will nanoparticle absorb to the surface long surfactants? And we studied this using molecular dynamic simulation. And this simulation shows that actually we have two different particles. And one is hydrophilic, another one hydrophobic. I first show you how the hydrophilic particle look like. We have three hydrophilic particles. One is positive charge, neutral, and negative charge. Here it shows that how those particles interact with long surfactant film. As you can see, all the particles penetrate the film, and some particle absorb the protein out of the surfactant film, and damage it. And in contrast, when you look at how does this hydrophobic particle look like, as you can see that all hydrophobic particle is trapped at the surface. As we all know that actually the carbon nanotube is hydrophobic, most likely it will be trapped by surfactant film. Come for our experimental observation in showing the previous slide. We also studied that if you throw the particle into surfactant in the bulk phase, what's gonna happen? So this figure shows that if you throw the surfactant particle into uh, a silver nanoparticle hydrophilic into a lung surfactant, and this shows that you throw a hydrophobic polystyrene particle into the lung surfactant, what it look like? It's gonna form different corona structure. Uh, I'm not gonna, I don't have much time to go too much detail about this, okay? And also, um, some people ask me, uh, um, well, everything so far you study is droplet. You know, how do you know the survey tension you predicted is relevant to, um, to physiology? So actually what we did is we collaborate with uh, um, other researchers who do the animal experiments. We let those animals, uh, more like a mouse, to inhale nanoparticle. And then we predict that using the surface tension measurement, we predict that the surface tension will be increasing when you have a certain concentration of particle delivered into the animal's lung. On the other side, we look at the lung uh, texture, you know, this uh, it's a, 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 a lung tissue. As you can see here, without nanoparticle, without nanoparticle into your lung, and your alveolar is fully open. So this indicating a very easy gas, gas exchange. However, when you have nanoparticle into your lung, you see large amount of your alveolars got collapsed. So that actually gonna have difficulty in breathing. Just therefore this data confirmed that our in vitro survey tension measurements indeed correlate to physiology response in a certain degree. Okay, so this is the second part of this talk. And I still have like a, five or 10 minutes, I quickly moving on to the second, the third topic is mask usage. So it's important to talk about mask, you know, especially right now. So uh, those figures shows that the typical mask you will see uh, in the market. And the respirator usually you don't see, and that's just the reusable one. That's actually not many people use it. So uh, N95, surgical mask and cloth mask, that's a very commonly used and, and right now by all of us. And what is the texture of those filter material in the masks? So this figure shows that the common fabric structure of the filter materials. So we have, uh, this shows the knitted, woven, 
and non-woven. As you can see here, this shows the electron microscopy structure of those uh, texture uh, fabrics. So most of this surgical mask, surgical mask has three layers, N95 has four layers, but the filter material in the middle are made of non-woven non uh, 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 material. The reason for this is this is easier to be mass productive. So you can produce this non-woven uh, uh, cloth fairly quickly in a large quantity. So this actually is one of the two uh, non-woven uh, uh, technique. It's called a, a, a melt bloom, which is going to allow you to produce a large amount of filter material in a fairly short period of time. And this filter material need to have a very small pore size. <clears throat> so this video actually shows that how the mask reduce the uh, drop in aerosol dispersion in air. This is the video taken by high-speed camera. As you can see here, any kind of mask, cloth mask, one layer, two layers, surgical mask, all help to prevent the droplets from spreading for too much. And I here show you another video that use a different technique is a laser visualization. This is actually is, uh, this is actually the video I also show you in the previous slides. And here I show you, if you have a layer of mask, what's gonna happen? This is the without the mask. As you can see here, the particle propagates to a very long distance. So this is a very simple mask made of napkin.
This is a cough and cough mask. So it does show that any kind of mask helps, okay? <clears throat> so here is the comparison of different masks. As you can see here, usually uh, the this comparison of the particle pupillation efficiency, usually uh, the surgical mask, uh, N95 is the best filtration efficiency and better than surgical mask, and better than the cloth mask. But actually, as you can see from the previous video, any of this mask actually helps. And also for the cloth mask has been mostly used by the general public <clears throat> and uh, the different material make a difference, and especially the uh, uh, the TPI, which is the threat a threat per inch. Basically, how dense the material is, is actually make a huge difference. Also, the layer make a huge difference. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, uh, CDC recommend that you should not wear a closed mask only with one layer. Make minimum two layers. Minimum two layers. Okay. <clears throat> so finally, let's look. Let's look at what does CDC recommend. Uh, CDC recommend you do chose masks that have two or more layers of washable or breastable fabric. CDC recommend you wash the mask every day, cloth mask. So, and you completely cover your nose and mouth and fit snugly against the sides of your face and do, don't have gaps and have a nose wear to prevent air from leaking out of the top of the mask. As you can see in the previous video, and most of the particle actually leak from the top uh, in the space between your nose and, and in top part of the uh, part, part of the mask. And do not choose masks that actually are made of fabric that actually make it hard to brace. <clears throat> and you need to balance the filtration efficiency and breathability. And make sure uh, do not use a mask with uh, valves and ventilation vents. Uh, there are video actually shows that actually those valves actually is, is a one way valve. So in other words, if you carry the virus, you're going to still going to pass to other people. So and and CDC doesn't recommend to use N95 because those are reserved to the healthcare providers, especially right now we are have a shortage of PPE. Okay. So basically, that's all the message I want to deliver. So finally, I want to wrap up with some take home message. So number one, and SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted by air. The simply breathing can spread the virus. So uh, you, you don't need a sniff of cough to spread the virus. So even when you talk, when you exercise, when you're breathing, actually you can spread the virus. So make sure you wear the mask, wear the mask, and any kind of mask helps, okay? Any kind of mask is, this period is actually, you could never be, become a hero so easily just by wearing a mask, okay? You can help a lot of people. That's actually a very easy way, very cheap way to slow down the spread of the virus. <clears throat> and surfactants could be useful. So the pigs and the cows, they save the lives of thousands of premature babies because we use surfactant to treat them. So now we may have a chance to use surfactants also to treat COVID patients, but of course, uh, uh, and we still, the, the uh, results is still uh, to come. Finally, I wanna thank my students, uh, my collaborator, and actually, uh, and uh, we studied, we started the research on aerosol transmission with Will, uh, and also with uh, Wei Tao, uh, the associate professor in Howard University. So three of us, we drafted the review article in ACS Nano uh, about aerosol transmission of, of the uh, COVID-19. If you're interested, you're, you can read that paper. Uh, I also wanna thank my uh, funding support from NSF. We have been continually funded by NSF on particle research and aerosol research. And for that, I really appreciate it. 
And th finally, thank you for your attention. I welcome any question you may have. And uh, happy new year for those celebrate Chinese New Year's. Well, thank you, Professor Zhou. Um, now um, it's open for questions from the audience. Uh, hey, hey, Joe, uh, thank you for the excellent uh, presentation. I have just very quick and simple question. Um, you said that when people cough, then the aerosol travels like 12 feet. Um, but what if they just talk? When they're normal talking, then how far the aerosol travel? Uh, the distance so far, we don't know. And actually what we know that actually is uh, the live virus has been cultured. The live virus has been cultured from the exhale of the COVID-19 patients. So there are research doing that. You know, basically what you do is you collect the exhalate, exhalation, you know, from the COVID-19 patients. So, mm -hmm. and then you do the PCR, you, you try to culture the virus and you found that actually, and there are a large amount of virus particle in their exhaled gas, air. So, but how far it can travel, we don't know. But we know one thing is it's gonna suspend in air for a long time if you don't have a good ventilation. Does anybody measure like diffusivity or, or anything? I don't know. So, so far, most of this uh, uh, flu mechanics measurements, as you can see here, reserved to something with a, flu, with a velocity. So, uh, such as the coughing, sniffing, and, and those without a velocity. And I don't know how many people have been studied that so far. So, this is actually a lot of flu mechanics people is working on this. How much the, the air conditioning system can, can influence the internal infection? Huge, huge. So actually, you know, uh, for one thing is actually we talk about indoor and outdoor. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, most of the uh, uh, aerosol transmission, we talk about indoor environments. So very unlikely it's gonna happen outdoor. So it's really need a certain concentration and to, uh, to infect you. But for indoor environments, poor ventilation, especially in hospital, that is very, very likely, very, very likely. So in classroom, for example, another possibility, I'm lucky that we don't go back to the classroom at the moment. And mm. uh, we talk about this uh, uh, indoor environment. So uh, with poor ventilation, that is most likely. And if we talk about outdoor environment, is that possible? And there are a lot of research I didn't got a chance to talk about right now. So there are new research been showing up that actually air pollution could also contribute to uh, the spread of uh, COVID mm -hmm. aerosol in outdoor environments. So in other words, there is a possibility that actually the virus particle could absorb to the uh, PM 2.5 yeah, yeah, yeah. and then suspending air for a long time. If so, that's gonna be huge. That can be a big problem. Okay, thanks. No problem. Any other questions? I have a question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Is there a noticeable difference for the spread by breathing between mouth and nose breathing? Uh, I think, you know, uh, basically all the air coming from a lung. So, and uh, both mouth and nose, actually, actually uh, uh, most of the research, as you can see here, uh, especially flu mechanical visualization experiment shows that a uh, uh, particle out of your mouth that actually is uh, uh, visually more striking. As you can see here, a lot of water <laughs> saliva came out. So uh, when you sneeze, uh, I, uh, I'm pretty sure you also have a liquid out of your nose, but, but because of velocity, I think that's kind of hard to measure. Uh, uh, so most of the measurements so far is done by uh, droplet out of the mouth. But Certainly, I think all the air uh, get out of your lung. Uh, if you are infected, uh, uh, you know, the virus particle will be associated with, uh, with the air. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Nice. Um, yeah, so, I, have two, yeah, I have two questions. Um, the first is how is the, uh, the airflow inside your uh, airway influence the, uh, the transfer of those uh, tiny aerosols deep into the lung? And uh, the second question is about your uh, MD simulations. 
I, I, I don't understand how, um, I, I don't understand how hydrophilic nanoparticles can actually interrupt the, uh, the membrane, the, the, the surfactant structure. So can you uh, explain Got a little it. bit about that? Got it. So um, for the first question, actually, you know, how the airflow affect the particle in your lung, in the airway? Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I want to show, um, share my uh, talk again. So, uh, this figure shows the structure of the airway uh, in the lung. So, 23 generations. As you may know, that there, there are many, there are many well established mathematical models and the CFD model for lung uh, airflow in the lung. So uh, most of this model was established in the past 20 years because of the uh, uh, aerosol uh, drug delivery. Uh, aerosol drug delivery is, uh, pulmonary drug delivery is the next <laughs> uh, hot area. So that's, there are a lot of mathematical model, CFD model talk about, you know, how the particle gonna flow uh, in the lung, in the airway. So, uh, so far what we know is uh, the mechanism, fluid mechanics mechanism governing the particle mo motion are very different in the different side, different places of the airway. So mostly because of the velocity and the size of the, the tube. So for example, in the uh, upper airway, the, uh, the tracheal, tracheal is very uh, uh, thick. It's about a, a, a centimeters, you know, and it's very thick. So in that case, you know, the particle has a larger velocity so in that case, is impaction is actually play a role. So most of the particle mo moving with a very uh, quick velocity, most of it is a linear, uh, it's, a, it's a straight motion. So that actually it doesn't change direction much. So it's gonna moving straight and impact on the surface and either adhere there or, or bounce back. So that is the mechanism in the upper airway. Uh, when you go to a lower airway, small airways, and the velocity been significantly reduced. Velocity been significantly reduced. In this case, gravitational sedimentation probably play a role. In that case is particle can sediment in, in that region. So in terms of navier stokes equation, as you can see here, there are difference. Uh, if you analyze, you know, the Reynolds number, if you analyze, you know, the, uh, the other dimensionless, very dimensionless groups, you're gonna see a big difference compared to the motion in this region and compared to the upper airway. And when they get into alveolar region, the velocity is nearly zero. The velocity of the fluid is nearly zero. So the particle is moving mostly by Brownian motion. So in that case, apparently you're gonna use an alternative way to simulate the particle motion in, in that part. You know, uh, I, I think that uh, this is actually what I understand about this. You know, I, I think actually Will is here. Uh, Will is actually, you know, also study particle. He may want to say something about this uh, 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 to address this question. Will, you want to say something about it? Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting subject. There are a lot of lattice Boltzmann simulations of uh, the small particles in the uh, avioli and uh, um, other models as well with uh, both convection and diffusion of the particles, yeah. So, so, right. so the, does the uh, airflow start all the way from the alveoli or does it start somewhere no, in, in the middle? The air is directly from the from, uh, inhale from here. So you inhale from the mouse, the air flow down, and, but the velocity reduced, velocity reduced significantly. So- no, But then uh, when you exhale, when, uh, where does yes. the flow start? When so, you exhale? The lung actually, yes, it's, it's going to draw air from there, from, from here. Uh, basically, you, you, you actually feel CO2 out of here. So the lung work like a negative pressure. So what it do is, it, when you inhale, it creates a negative pressure to draw air into the lung. As you can see, the suction is not that big because of the ventilation pressure is only a tenth of centimeter of water. So it's a very, very small pressure to draw air into there. So when you exhale, you, you do not push air out. So it's oh, more like okay. a diffusion out. It's, you don't push air out. So it's, it's not that much. The ventilation pressure when we're doing the normal tidal bracing is it, only a few tens of centimeter of water. It's a very, very small pressure variation. Mm -hmm. So the lung design in a way that actually, the lung design in that way that actually the volume only change about 30% or something, uh, uh, no more than 50%. You're never gonna empty your lung. So during normal tidal bracing, 
So, and, and it's it, the surface area of the lung defined even to be even change smaller. So surface area of the lung change probably less than 20% during normal tidal breathing. So, mm -hmm. and, and because of the, all of this alveolar, there, there are meaning, 300 million of them. So that, that's actually, a, a, we can talk a lot of lung physiology, but here, but, but I think we can stop here for, for, okay. for now. So we can talk more about it. But there are a lot of mathematic models. There are a lot of mathematic models, full models from the third generation to 23rd generation, full model of lung, of the uh, fluid motion in the lung has been implemented. There are a lot of research about that. So Sam, what is your second question? By the uh, way? So about, about how hydrophilic nanoparticles can interrupt the membrane. Got it. Right, it, it sounds like, you know, it will not so, uh, because it's gonna penetrate. So mm -hmm. when you look at this cartoon, when you look at the cartoon, actually it shows that the red colored hydrophobic particle, if you're trapped here, uh, everybody understand that because you know the hydrophobic tail of the uh, lung surfactants gonna trap those particles in here. But how's the hydrophilic particle show? So, and, and hydrophilic particle most likely gonna penetrate. So, however, this cartoon actually partially inspired by our simulation data. It shows that actually the hydrophilic particle, even though it penetrates the surfactant film, it could have a problem because it's it's going to absorb the surfactant protein. So that is a big problem. As you can see here, there's certain kind of protein absorbed on the surface. They're gonna form a corona on the surface of the, pro on the surface of uh, nanoparticle. And this corona actually draw molecule out of the surfactants so that the surfactant film does not function anymore. So that is one big uh, uh, pathophysiology that we discovered uh, from our simulation data and in uh, uh, 2013. So this research, uh, I showed this video one more time. Mm -hmm. This is the anionic particle, anionic particle. As you we know that actually most particle, regardless of this is original charge, once you deliver into liquid is all carry negative charge. So, so in other words, all particle is anionic uh, in physiological fluids. So when an anionic particle, hydrophilic, you get into the lung, as you can see here, it quickly penetrates. It quickly penetrates. However, as you can see here, it pull one surfactant molecule, protein molecule, out of the out of the interface. So once the protein is immobilized onto solid particle, it will be denatured. So that we know that we only have less than ten percent of protein in the surfactant, and those ten percent actually is so important. Without the protein. <laughs> we don't have lung surfactant. Without the protein, we only have a uh, cooking oil at home. So, so you know, the so, so surfactant is phospholipid. It's the same structure as cooking oil. So the fact that it's behave as surfactants is because they have 10% protein. If you destroy the protein, your surfactant does not work. Sweet, excellent, yeah. thanks. All right, I think uh, we can stop right here today and let's thank Professor Zhou again for this excellent presentation. And everybody have a good weekend and um, we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, bye.